Welcome, welcome. New Earth Restoration Sabbath service. Uh, we're so happy to have you all here with us this morning. This is a type of Mikra Kodesh, uh, a set apart rehearsal. And although we are spread out uh, by some, in some cases, great distances, some less or so, uh, we all can come together still with the aid of technology and keep the Sabbath. And it's a thrill uh, to have the various speakers come in and to have the fellowship and the friendships that result uh, from this ministry endeavor together as we are trying to get the word out, get the word out about Yeshua Messiah and his blood atonement, the critical nature of what is needed for every man, woman, and child to come to the Father. And so uh, with that, uh, let me share here a scripture. See if I can get this up here. Yeah. Bear with me for a minute here. Let's try that one there. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, this is from Isaiah 57, 19 to 21. And I think this scripture is especially relevant today because uh, we are living in troublesome times. We're living in a time where war and the lack of peace seems to be exploding throughout the world. Now, here's what Father Yahweh says about this. Isaiah 57, 19 through 21 I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him that is far off, and to him that is near, saith Yahweh, and I will heal him. This is what the Master Yahweh says to the world, peace, peace, to him that is far off, and to him that is near. We know that the Master wants peace on the earth and goodwill among men. But we have a problem of wickedness, it says here, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my Elohim, to the wicked. Now, the Apostle Paul had similar sentiments. Uh, Ephesians 2, 16 through 18 says, and that he, this is speaking of Yeshua Messiah and his blood atonement for all believers, and that he might reconcile both unto Yahweh, he's talking about Jew and Gentile, reconcile both unto Yahweh in one body by the cross. Doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or you're Gentile or a house of Israel, in that case, a Gentile. It uh, doesn't matter whether you're some Guinea man out somewhere. Guess what? The master has reconciled us into one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were far off, and to them that were nigh, those of us close by. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And we thank you for that. Uh, we thank the Father for that, brother, uh, for sending his Son that we might have peace. And that we are ambassadors for Messiah. Absolutely. So let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for your peace that resides in our hearts, even in the midst of the storm. Give us more of that peace, more and more, as these troublesome days are approaching. Father, bless the speakers, bless the ministers. Help us, Father, to present something that glorifies you. And we give you the praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Heisen? We gather and bless Yahweh. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, sovereign of the universe. Baruch Atah Yahweh Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Who sanctifies us by your mitzvot and calls us to hear the Kol Shofar. 
אשר קידשנו במצוותיו, וציוונו לשמוע כה שופר. We call upon our Father and the heavenly realms. Avinu Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, let our praise, blessings, and prayers rise up through the Shamayim and be joined and magnified through all the ascending levels of the heavens by all who serve you therein, culminating in united, joyful, resounding music and a sweet savor to your very throne and your presence. Blessed be your name. May you hear us on this set-apart day. Basic Shema. Hear, O Yisrael, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Blessed is the name of his esteemed realm forever. Baruch Shem Kivod, Malkuto, Leolam Vayed. We bless the Blessed One, Baruch Ku. Baruch Ek Yahweh Hamavarach, Baruch Yahweh Hamavarach, Leolam Vayed. Bless Yahweh, the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Remember the Shabbat day to keep it set apart. Six days will you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Shabbat of Yahweh your Elohim. In it you will do you will not do any work. For in six days Yahweh made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. That is why Yahweh blessed the seventh day and set it apart. Speak also unto the children of Israel, saying, Above all, my Shabbatot you will keep. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, so that you may know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. The Israelites are to observe the Shabbat, celebrating it for the generations to come as an enduring covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. And it will come to pass that from one new month to another, from one Shabbat to another, all flesh will come to worship before me, says Yahweh. Mika Mocha. Who is like you, O El Elyon of Israel? in heaven and on earth, that he can perform in accordance with your great works and your good strength. Who is like your people Israel, whom you have chosen for yourself from all the peoples of the lands, the people of the covenants, learned in statutes, enlightened in understanding? Shield of Abraham. O King, Helper, Savior, and Shield. Blessed are you, Yahweh, Shield of Abraham. Baruch Ata Yahweh Magen Avraham. Blessed are you, O Yahweh Elohim, King of the Universe. Baruch Ata Yahweh Eloheinu Melech Haolam. Who has given us the Torah of Truth? Asher Natan Lanu. Torah met and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Vikeya Olam not a bit token you. We bless Moshiach. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, sovereign of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Baruch atah Yahweh, Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher naten lanu et derek ha-yashua, v'meshiach Yashua. So with joy we draw living water from the springs of deliverance. 
who shoved him high in my imbecile throne, me mehene Yeshua. Healing 40. I waited, I waited, I waited so long. I cried out, I cried out, I cried out so strongly. Out of the pit of destruction, Father, out of the miry clay, I waited. I cried out, for I had lived so wrongly. But you drew me from the pit of destruction, lifted me from the quicksand of my sin. Then you set my feet on the sacred mountain. You gave me songs of praise. I waited. You save me, I'm singing ever singing, because my weight is o'er. We minister Shalom. Shalom be yours, ministering Malachim, Malachim of the El Elyon. Coming forth from the Sovereign of Sovereigns, the Kadosh One, blessed is He. Shalom Aleichem, Melchei HaSharet, Melchei Elyon. Mi Melech Melchei HaMakim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. May your coming forth be in Shalom, Malachim of Shalom, Malachim of the El Elyon. Coming forth from the Sovereign of Sovereigns. The Kadosh One, blessed is He. Bokem le shalom, malachi ha shalom, malachi el yon. Mihi melech, malachi ha mlachim, ha kadofush baharuk hu. Bless us with shalom, malachim of shalom, malachim of the El Elyon. Coming forth from the Sovereign of Sovereigns, the Kadosh One, blessed is He. Barku Nila Shalom, Malachi HaShalom, Malachi Eyon. Mi Melech Malachi HaMlachim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Yerushak, Hatan, and Homily. There are two roads, one of life and one of death. There is great variance between the two. First of all, we will care for Elohim who brought us into being. Secondly, you will care for your neighbor as yourself. All that we would not have happen to us, we will make sure does not happen to another. Yahweh Elohim created humans to rule over the world, appointing for them two spirits in which to walk until the time set for his visitation. These are the spirits of truth and falsehood, an upright nature and destiny originate in the territory of light, and a perverse nature originates in the fountain of darkness. The authority of the Prince of Light extends to governing of all righteous people. So, of course, they walk in the paths of light. Likewise, the authority of the angel of darkness grips the government of all vile people. So, naturally, they walk in the paths of darkness. Yet, the Elohim of Israel and the Moloch of his truth aid all the sons of light. It is actually he who created the spirits of light and darkness, making them the foundation stone of everything done. Their impulse is the reason for every act. Elohim's love for one spirit endures forever. He will always be pleased with such acts. But the counsel of the other he hates, despising its every impulse for all time. Here are their operations in the world. 
one lights up a person's mind, straightening the pathways before him in true righteousness and causing his heart to respect the laws of Elohim. This spirit produces humility, patience, great compassion, continued goodness, insight, understanding, and powerful wisdom resonating to each of Elohim's works kept by his constant faithfulness. It produces a spirit knowledgeable in every plan of action, zealous for the laws of righteousness, devoted in its thoughts, and unfaltering in purpose. This spirit encourages plenty of compassion on all who hold tightly to the truth, and magnificent clarity combined with an instinctive hatred of impurity in its every disguise. It results in humble conduct combined with wide-ranging discernment with an ability to conceal truth, that is, the mysteries of knowledge. So the earthly counsel of the Spirit works to these ends for those whose character yearns for truth. Through a gracious visitation, all who walk in this Spirit will know healing, bountiful peace, long life, and a prodigious family, followed by enduring blessings and continual joy through a long-lasting life. They will receive a crown of favor with a robe of honor dazzling forever and ever. Let us choose life. Let us choose to be the sons and daughters of light. Amen. Tefillot, Sevenfold Millennial Prayer. Okay, uh, so at this time, uh, we traditionally uh, have our prayer request uh, taken. And Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. And uh, Professor Smith, brother, thank you for that wonderful prayer. It, it spoke to my heart. I would like to uh, thank Sister Vicki. She has been instrumental in this series. She has graciously done all of the slides for me. So I pray that Yahweh uh, blesses her for that. And yes, this is the third installment, brother. Yeah, it's, it's supposedly my last in this installment, unless the Ruach says different. But this will basically add a little bit to it and sum it up. We have to remember that the world is bearing witness to the darkness. And we are called to be lights. We have to be. We have to be lights because without us shining our light here, there is no light. There's only darkness. So, so let's shine our lights, brothers and sisters. And we do that by, by speaking forth the word of truth. So I'd like to talk about in this third one is administration and why it's very important. It, uh, it occurs seven times in the Brit Hadashah. And it is the same word that is translated as dispensation in our Bibles. Um, and it has a bad rap. <laughs> it's gotten a bad rap over the years because it's come with a lot of uh, baggage and interpretations with it. But what we want to do is just slow things down. Not rush. Consider the words that are being spoken. And then understand what these words truly mean so we can apply them in the correct way. So it can also be translated management or stewardship. Thayer says it's the management of a household or of household affairs. Um, I've been saying this for a while that it's, it's the heading up of a household basically, but specifically the management, oversight, administration of another's property. And it's the office of a manager or overseer, a stewardship, and then administration and dispensation or synonyms. So in Luke 16, verses 2 through 4, we see, So having called him, he said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, administration, dispensation, if you will. That's the word. For you are no longer able to be manager, a steward. 
And the steward manager said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the managership or stewardship. There's that word, administration, away from me. I am unable to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do. That when I'm removed from my stewardship, management, dispensation, they might receive me into their houses. Yeshua here definitively proves exactly what it is. Remember, this is the exact same word that is translated in most of our Bibles as dispensation or uh, in, the, in the ones that are a little more literal, it's administration. And it shows us that there is something we are given authority over that belongs to somebody else. The length of time as to how long that stewardship or that administration isn't mentioned. But we can assume that as long as the steward is faithful, he remains in his position as steward of the stewardship or of the administration. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17 and verse 16. For if I bring the good news, it is no boasting for me, for necessity is laid on me. And it is woe to me if I do not bring the good news. For I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if not voluntarily, I am entrusted with a dispensation, administration, management. Paul is speaking of a stewardship here, and it's clearly defined as, in verse 16, proclaiming the good news. So he's his stewardship is proclaiming the good news. In Ephesians 1.10, um, I'm going to, uh, well, we'll read it here. And a minister at the completion of time to gather together in one all in Messiah both which are in the heavens and which are on the earth in him. The version from this LSB is a little better, I think. It says, for an administration, which is that's what it, there's that word, of the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Messiah, things in the heavens and things on the earth in him. That word actually means to head up, so as to sum up everything under one head, the things that are in the heavens, and things that are in the earth, so all together, the entire kingdom in Messiah in him. All things will be again gathered together. It actually means sum it up. So Ephesians 3, please. Ephesians 3, 1 through 6. Just as in Luke 16, about the steward and his stewardship, we see Paul here easily understandable now from Luke 16 as to what exactly a dispensation or a stewardship, or an administration is. So we read, because of this, I, Shaul, the, am the prisoner of Yeshua Messiah on behalf of you, the nations. Indeed, if you have heard of the administration of the favor of Elohim that was given to me for you, that by revelation was made known to me the secret, as I wrote before briefly, in reading this, when you are able to understand my, my insight into the secret of Messiah, the mystery in most of our Bibles, that says, but it's a secret, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it now has now been revealed by the Spirit to a set-apart emissaries and prophets. The nations are to be co-heirs, united in the same body, and joint, again, that word joint is missing in this translation, but it's joint partakers together in the promise in Messiah through the good news. We also see what a stewardship and administration is. We saw it was the proclamation of the good news in 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 17, we saw. And here we see what that good news is, the unmerited favor or grace of Yahweh. Verse 3 tells us that it was a secret. Verse 5 tells us it was not made known to other generations, other times past. Just like in Luke 18, 31 through 34. And taking the 12 aside, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all that has been written by the prophets about the son of Adam shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered up to the nations, and shall be mocked, insulted, and spat upon. And having flogged him, they shall kill him. And on the third day he shall rise again. But they understood none of this, and this word was hidden from them. And they did not know what was being said. It was a secret that was hid in Yahweh. 
silent in the scriptures. Roman tells us just like this. Luke 24, please, Vicky. Next, next slide. And he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all have to be filled, which were written in the Torah of Moshe and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now, so at this point, they get the, they get their understanding open. Now they understand this. And he said to them, with their minds open, thus it has been written. And so it was necessary for Messiah to suffer and to rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these matters. So we saw before his crucifixion, it was hid from them. After he divinely opened their understanding. And now they understood what he meant back in Luke 18 when he told them that it was hid from. The nations, Gentiles, were now joint heirs and joint bodies and joint sharers of his promise in Messiah through the good news. And we looked what that promise was last week. Okay, it is clear. We need to remember that sometimes in the pursuit of truth, we are shown things that are uncomfortable. That may take us out of our comfort zone. That may um, go against what we, we may believe. But let Yahweh be true and every man a liar. His word is what we base our truth off of. So it is clear who the blame was on for killing the Messiah. He came in fulfillment of prophecy in both the Torah in Genesis 49.10. And next slide, Vicky. There we go. The scepter shall not turn aside from Yehuda, nor an inscriber from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him, Shiloh is the obedience of peoples. Messiah, we know that. Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 19. I shall raise up a prophet like you out of the midst of their brothers, and I shall put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be the man who does not listen to my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. We're well familiar with this. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's just, let's just see what it says. For you, brothers, became imitators of the assemblies of Elohim, which are in Yehuda in Messiah Yeshua, because you also suffered the same treatment from your own countrymen, as they also from the Yahudim, who killed both the Master Yeshua and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and who displease Elohim and are hostile to all men. All we have to do is look at 1 John 2, right? It tells us exactly why, because if you don't have the Son, you do not have the Father, and you're of the Antichrist, it says. Forbidding us to speak to the nations, that they might be saved, so as to fill up their sins always. But the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. This is very clear scripture. Yahweh did exactly what he did in ages past when his people rejected his prophets. He sent his prophets. They would not hear. They would not repent and return to the Torah and its blessings. Rather, Yahweh used their enemies as instruments of his judgment that has happened time and time again throughout the history of Israel. We are all well familiar with that. Yahweh gave them a period of time to repent after this and to enter into the new covenant with Yeshua through his blood, not by the blood of bulls offered by the Aaronic priesthood. Yahweh gave them 40 years. We all know how significant the number 40 is in regardless to testing. In regards to testing, the administration of the unmerited favor of Yahweh, the dispensation of the grace of God, so to speak, in most of our news, our Bibles, it has a different high priest. The Aaronic priesthood, the high priest is a man who administers the book of the law and as a human high priest. 
the Melchizedekian priesthood. The high priest is Yeshua, and he administers the new covenant with Torah, uh, with covenant Torah, that is Torah that is spoken to us in covenant promise. It has a different location. The book of the law with the Aaronic system as an earthly administration in the land of promise. The book of the covenant is administered in heavenly places in the heavenly temple where Yeshua went, where our high priest is currently residing. It has different offerings. Animal sacrifices for the cleansing of the flesh. Hebrews 9.13 For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the defile, sets apart for the cleansing of the flesh. Sarps. Flesh and blood. To cover sin once and for all, offering a Messiah for cleansing of the conscience. Hebrews 9.14 how much more shall the blood of the Messiah, who through the everlasting Ruach offered himself unblemished to Elohim, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve, to serve the living Elohim? There's the contrast. The cleansing of the flesh by the blood of bulls and goats compared to the cleansing of the, clock, the conscience by the blood of the Messiah, right? The cleaning of the inside of the cup, right? The Pharisees were guilty, and those that followed them were guilty of cleaning the outside of the cup, but the inside remained filthy. Yeshua says, no, no, my covenant, I will clean your insides. And that's what we're, and that's the difference, brothers and sisters. And he came and, and, and he did this to abolish sin. Hebrews 9, 25, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters into the set apart place year by year with blood, not his own. Yom Kippur, right? Or if so, he would have had to offer or to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, just now, that word means in the Greek, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the offering of himself. He has a different priesthood that offered different sacrifices. Book of the life or book of the law offers animals shed blood was offered by priests. The New Covenant, the Book of the Torah, priests offer up spiritual sacrifices through our high priest to offer up unto Yahweh. Ephesians 13, verse 10, we have a slaughter place from which those serving the tent have no authority to eat. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the set-apart place by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. So Yeshua also suffered outside the gate to set apart the people with his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have no lasting city here, but we seek the one coming. Just ask yourself, what is he speaking of in verse 14? He's saying, we don't have a lasting city here physically, but we seek the one coming that was promised to Abraham. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a slaughter offering of praise to Elohim. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And do not forget to do good and to share, for with such slaughter offerings, Elohim is well pleased. These are the slaughter offerings that the, that the Melchizedekian priesthood, in which we're a part of, the royal priesthood, with our high priest in the heavenlies, these are the offerings we offer up. Next slide, please, Vicki. Lastly, we see a different Torah. The Book of the Law has the Aaronic priesthood. It was added after the golden calf. It was given as a schoolmaster until the promised seed should come. The New Covenant. Sacrifices of animals and earthly Aaronic priesthood are nailed to the cross. The Book of the Covenant Torah is active as it was to Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and the ones from Adam and Eve onward. It is devoid of ethnic or national restrictions. Why? Because the message is to the lost sheep of Israel that was scattered prior to 500 BC. The message is to any and all that will hear 
Abraham and the promise in Genesis 15 knew no Israel. Lastly, well, let's read Galatians 3. Paul explains to us that the purpose of the book of the law that we saw was written and put at the side, the Ark of the Covenant, as a witness against them from Deuteronomy 31, or schoolmaster until the reform of the Reformation enacted by Yeshua. Galatians 3.24, therefore the Torah became our trainer. The, and remember, we looked at this last time and in the time before. We have already set the context by Galatians 3.10 when he says the Torah and the book of the law and under the law. He's already made that clear in Galatians 3.10. He has set what he's talking about. It is the book of the law. And we looked at what the book of the law was right from the Torah. So therefore, that, therefore, the book of the law became our trainer unto Messiah in order to be declared right by belief. And after belief has come, we are no longer under a trainer. For you are all sons of Elohim through belief in Messiah Yeshua. For as many of you as were immersed into Messiah, as put on Messiah, there is neither Yahudi nor Greek, there is not slave nor free, there is not male or female, for you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. And if you are of Messiah, then you are the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. What's the promise? We we That's the whole point of these. We've been looking. We know exactly what the covenants of promise were. They were given in Genesis 12 by an oath out of Yahweh's own lips. It was blood ratified in Genesis 15 and it, with the promise that there would it would be offered to a nation 430 years later, which it was. It was accepted. It was ratified. It was agreed to. They had a covenant confirming meal with Elohim himself. But then they broke it less than 40 days later by the sin of the golden calf. They committed adultery. They broke their marriage covenant and they were set aside. Rather than being eradicated by Yahweh, Moses intervened and he mediated for the nation. And Yahweh showed them mercy and put them under a Levitical Aaronic priesthood with, with, with laws that was to keep them from, from death and from being uh, cast aside into the nations. And it was their guide master and their guide and their, their uh, a sign, it says, to show them the way of life. They were to walk in that Torah and they were to walk in that Torah until the promised seed should come as Genesis 49. 10 says and the and the prophet from Deuteronomy 18 it is the it is the um until the promised seed should come and the promised seed came and he says and when he comes you are no longer under a trainer right we have to return to a covenant torah and that's why it is all about administration yahweh deals in administrations he puts people as stewards over as as we looked at from the gospels he puts us as stewards and ambassadors for his, his son, Messiah, so we can go forth and speak this message. So we do keep Torah. We keep the covenant Torah, the Torah that does not uh, have guides and tutors. In other words, we are not under a Levitical priesthood serving in an earthly temple. The Torah and the uh, administration has been changed to the order of Melchizedek with our Messiah as the one and only forever high priest by his own blood. And we are his royal priesthood, walking in covenant Torah, spreading forth the message of Yeshua, offering up as our priesthood, slaughter offerings of our praise, our thanksgivings, and our worship to him. Remember Paul's allegory of Sarah and Hagar. Say to me, you who wish to be under Torah, now we know to me the book of the law. Say to me, and or you can even look at that as the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood with that sacrificial system. Say to me, you who wish to be under that, do you not hear the Torah? For it has been written that Abraham had two sons, one by a female servant, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the female servant was born to the flesh. Right? Like we just looked at the two, the difference between the two, Melchizedekian and the and the Levitical, right? But he was the female service according to the flesh, Levitical. We know that. He was a and he of the free man, free woman through promise. 
Melchizedekian. This is allegorical. For these are the two covenants, one for Mount Sinai, which means for slavery, which is Hagar. This mount, or for Hagar, is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in slavery with her children. But the contrast, the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all that we looked at last week that Abraham saw. That talks about in chapters 11, 12, and 13, that we look to by faith. Who where, That's where our citizenship is. It's not here, brothers and sisters, and not any nation, and it's not even on this earth. It is in his father's house where he went to prepare a place where our temple is that we serve, right? For now, we're here. While we're alive, we're here, serving as his royal priesthood here in the flesh. But when we're changed, when that day comes and we are changed, hallelujah, we are going to be fully in our service then as royal priesthood, serving under covenant Torah, bringing forth the message to the nations and according to Ephesians, to the principality and powers and rulers in the heavenly realms, the ep oronoi heavens. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it has been written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who do not have birth pains. For the deserted one has many more children than she who has a husband. And we, brothers, as Yitzhak was, are children of promise. That's what Isaac was, right? He wasn't the, he wasn't the, the, uh, the down payment or he wasn't the, or the picture of the promise. He was the fulfillment of the promise, right? He was the miraculous birth from, from barren people. So he was the fulfillment of the promise. Shows that Yahweh was, was going to bring forth his promise. And that was the, that was the first step by, by having Isaac born when he shouldn't have been. Amen. But, he, but as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him according to the spirit, so also now. Right? That's what happened then. That's the biggest enemy was always the unbelieving Jews railing against the disciples. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the female servant and her son. For the son of the female servant shall by no means be heir with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the female servant, but of the free woman. Right? Because 1 John chapter 2 is paramount. If you do not have Yeshua, then you are a liar and an antichrist. So, in, in, uh, there's going to be a couple readings from the Nazarene Acts here. Um, it, this is my plug for this, okay? This book, if you've never read through the Nazarene Acts of the Apostles, or it's called the Recognitions of Clement, you need to. You really need to. If you're, if, you're, if you're seriously interested in understanding a lot of the deep things of Yahweh more fully, then read this. Because I've read it through cover to cover twice now. I've read through portions of it numerous times. But this is what I found. The Nazarene Acts is one of the strongest testimonies for the truth of this covenant I've been trying to talk about. Then Kifa answered, okay, and let's just read, let's just read what it says with an appearance of indignation. What do you suppose, Clement, that all of us can know all things before the time? But not to be drawn aside now from our proposed discourse, we will at another time, when your progress is more manifest, explain these things more distinctly. In other words, when you come become more mature, we'll we'll build on it. Then, however, a priest or a navi being anointed with the compounded ointment, putting fire to the altar of Yahweh, was held illustrious in all the world, right? The Aaronic priesthood. But after Aaron who was a priest, another is taken out of the waters. I do not speak of Moshe, but of him who in the waters of Mikvah was called by Yahweh his son. For the priest kindled for sins, for from the time he appeared, the anointing has ceased by which the office of Cohen or Navi or Melech was conferred at Yeshua's mikvah 
the priesthood was transferred like we looked at last week. Or uh, maybe it was the week before. Rick, can, next slide, please, Vicki. For we, said I, have ascertained beyond doubt that Yahweh is much rather displeased with the Zabadim, that's sacrifices that you offer, the time of sacrifice having now passed away. And because you will not acknowledge that the time for offering victims is now past, therefore the Hekel will be destroyed, and the abomination of desolation will stand in a devoted place, and then the Basora will be preached to the going the nations for a testimony against you that your belief may be judged by their faith. For the whole world at different times suffer under diverse maladies, either spreading generally over all or affecting specifically. Therefore, it needs a physician to visit it for its salvation. We therefore bear witness to you and declare to you what has been hidden from every one of you. It is for you to consider what is for your advantage. I say the same thing, brothers. It's for us. It is for us to consider. So is that paragraph I just read true? Absolutely it is. And we know it is because of what we just looked at these last three weeks. So, I'd like to end with this in First Chronicles. As for the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was given the firstborn, or he was the firstborn, but because he profaned his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, son of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. For Yehuda prevailed over his brothers, and from him came a ruler, although the birthright was Joseph's. Remember the cross-handed blessing. The right to the name of Israel does not belong to Judah or any other tribe. It belongs to Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who have been scattered since before 500 BC and assimilated into every nation on this planet. And that's why genealogy and DNA does not matter. Doesn't matter. And that's exactly what all those no difference verses mean, because that is what Yahweh's doing. He is plucking out from all over the world, all out of each nation, his beloved ones, his bride, the, the five virgins with the, with the oil in their lamps. And we have to do that. We have to walk in truth. And we have to walk in righteousness. And we, and, and we do that by performing what we're called to do. We serve our high priest in the heavenlies, where he is to this day waiting for the word from the word of his father to tell him to go get your beloved son. And then he's going to come and he's going to search the hearts of his people. And he's going to pluck out from his people the ones that had oil. So we need to make sure, brothers and sisters, in these days that we have that oil. So I pray that this has been a blessing to everybody that hears it. Whether you agree with it all or not, I ask you that you please put it at the feet of the Messiah. And if you are his, then he promises you that he will show you all truth and he will show you things to come if you are his. So the last thing I would like to do is to offer you a challenge. This is my challenge to people. Go through Paul's epistles and just read them. With the mindset of every time you see where he's telling people about under the law, and he's talking about the works of the law, read it with the understanding that he's talking about the law that applies to a priesthood that has now been rendered idle. That word abolished means rendered idle under Messiah's. Um, High priestship. So just read it with that. And you'll see that all of a sudden, these passages that people have argued for all this time about, about what he was talking about. Is he pro-Torah? Is he not pro-Torah? Paul is very pro-Torah, but he's pro-Torah in its proper administration. Covenant Torah under Messiah. So 
Unclean foods are unclean. Like we talked about last week, the teachings from the book of the law that do not involve the Levitical sacrificial systems, but the ones that talk about Shabbat, his festivals, his food ordinances, equal weights and measures, injustice between people that are wronged, all of that stuff, those things fill up the covenant Torah. They, are, they elaborate and they teach those things. So as, as we talked about, we are, we are to test the things that carry through is what that means. Remember, we talked about that. Those are the things that we take and they, and they carry through. But the parts about the sacrifices and those things, those are what we cut away. We leave behind because they've been rendered idle by the Messiah. So yes, we do have to, we have to rightly divide. That means, remember, I th we talked about a straight surgical cut, a separation, the word of truth, the Torah, right? The Levitical priest, that administration, Aaronic high priest or the Aaronic priesthood, nailed to the cross, rendered idle, the Melchizedekian Torah, Genesis 1, 1 through Exodus um, 24, 11 specifically with elements of the book of the law, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the rest of Exodus that fill up the teachings of the covenant Torah. We, by all means, that carries through and, we, and that we learn and we apply that. But the, but the stuff that is to be rendered idle and set aside, that we do. So, but thank you very much, y'all. I pray that Yahweh richly blesses you in your walks and your journeys. And I pray shalom on each and every one of you. Well, Baruch Hashem, thank you so much, uh, Brother Sean, uh, for that presentation. That was uh, the third installment of the Covenant series of Brother Sean McKinley has been presenting. And uh, we certainly look forward to much more of what he has to offer. And so at this time, uh, we're going to finish up the service and we will call on the Heisen. Have we a Eisen? I think Jackson, uh, is Jackson the one doing that today? Well, uh, until that uh, comes up, uh, does anybody have any uh, questions for Brother Sean? Uh, we'll keep waiting for the uh, the rest of the literature here, but in the meantime, uh, until we see it come up, uh, any questions quickly for him? There was one thing here, uh, a question here. Uh, unclean foods are clean. Uh, I, I think that's uh, think I, I I think that Sean uh, believes in the clean clean food laws there uh, absolutely absolutely I do those those are part of the things from the book of the law that carry right through to us today all those food ordinances I pig is still pig and so I mean absolutely every single one of those food ordinances absolutely carry through for sure okay uh we got some good comments here Uh, let's see here. Any other questions? Uh, either put them down in the chat or come on the mic. Uh, I think uh, I think Jackson was handling the uh, Zoom uh, sharing, right? He might be indisposed at the moment. Uh, he is beset with with several illnesses. Uh, Brother James Kramer put only the Levitical law and the blood sacrifices were canceled. Uh, Jerry is asking a question here, Brother Sean. That does not mean to separate milk and cheese. He's asking about that question. I uh, any thoughts on that, Brother Sean? Uh, what Jerry is asking? Um, nope. <laughs> I don't. Do you? <laughs> Okay, what he's talking about is this is retained by the 
rabbinical authorities, and they uh, they basically uh, take the scripture that says you shall not seethe a kid in his mother's milk, and so they use that to say that a person should not. Uh, and um, so um, let's uh, let's uh, have some discussion. And uh, we'll go as long as there is something to discuss. <laughs> Sometimes I get into these things where people just don't have anything to discuss, and I, I have to ad lib here and there. Uh, but uh, we'll have to see what we can come up with. Who has something to say or something to share? All right, Vicki, go ahead. Um, I wanted to uh, speak to, I think, the last couple of weeks. Brother James has um, pointed out, and rightly so, the differences between the um, the sacrifices versus the statutes and the ordinances of how we are to live our lives. And and I wanted to and and hope that maybe Brother Sean can go into a little bit of detail because it it, it is. A big question and can be a little bit confusing um, that no we don't throw out everything in Leviticus everything in Numbers everything in Deuteronomy everything we don't throw everything out this is about an administration of who our our high priest is it's not about um, you know if if our ox causes damage to our neighbor's oxen or our neighbor how do we deal with that how, how what is the proper way that, that we deal with those things and how we treat our neighbor and how we worship Yahweh um, those things are important they are good for us to go to when things like that happen in our daily lives and um, you know how we um, they're, they're good for us to refer to those. So I was hoping maybe um, that differentiation between what we are under a different administration of versus what do we, how do we live our daily lives under covenant Torah and under Torah, line upon line and precept upon precept. So that would be my hope that maybe Brother Sean can um, emphasize that maybe a little. Sure. Um, yeah, it's it's basically as you just said. It was like we were say, I was saying before um, that it's it. Who's your high priest? That 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 that's really the 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 question you need to ask yourself to define where to separate Torah. At, is who's your high priest? Is is it ordinances under the Levitical priesthood? Aaronic priesthood is it is an offering it's the priesthood functioning offering sacrifices or peace offerings of animals and things and is it under the administration or the dispensation I guess you know of a high priest on earth or is it in the heavenlies is, is, is your high priest Yeshua where there is no offerings of bulls and goats, you know, for peace offerings or for Thanksgiving offerings or for to cover sin. None of his was once and for all. Every everything that that was offered before was filled up and Telios was perfected and completed in him. It's done once for all. So moving forward, like like Hebrews 13, a, a careful study. Um, if you got, if, if people are looking for like, you know, where to study next or the kind of question where they want to read, do a study of Hebrews, particularly chapters seven through to the end. Um, it is, it is, it is profound. It is, it is Torah. What that is, what the book of Hebrews is, is Torah for people today. Really. Hebrews is, fills up for us today how we keep Torah 
without 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 our, uh the vitical system and the sacrificial system and the temple and all that because we don't need it that's been rendered idle right not 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 destroyed or obliterated but it's been rendered idle because messiah has brought in the new covenant <clears throat> because remember a covenant if you make a new covenant because you since you can't add anything to an old covenant or change it you have to make a new a brand new covenant in which you can bring forth the conditions of the old covenant into the new covenant and you can add whatever you wanted to it as long as it was presented agreed ratified by blood and then conferred with the meal right so that's exactly what messiah did the co the new covenant in his blood right fills up and shows the end goal that the schoolmaster or the guide that the book of the law was with all the sacrifices, all those sacrifices reminded them of their sin as a witness against them and pointed them to the Messiah, to the promised seed. That when he came, he fills those up, his blood, as opposed to the earthly, the Hagar, he takes it to the Sarah, the heavenlies, and presents it there in the heavenly places where he said he was going. Like people keep telling me, we don't go to heaven. We don't go to heaven when we die. The Messiah was a liar. Said John 14 that I'm going in my father's house to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare that place for you, then I'm going to come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, there you can be. So this is my answer to whether it's going to be in the heavens or on the earth or anywhere in between. Jacob's ladder's teaching is profound. Because it shows us that the kingdom of Yahweh is spans from the heavens to the earth. And he has ministers that minister in between all, between both, just like Jacob's ladder shows, right? And when we're placed in that administration, in that day, when we're when we're changed into our, as 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, into our spiritual heavenly forever bodies. So then we'll be then we'll be serving our our high priest face to face as his royal priesthood in the spiritual flesh, so to speak, before our father's house. We're going to be before our father's throne face to face then. And that is different, right? We have to test the things that carry through, test the things that are different in the Greek, right? That's different, isn't it? It's because it's an allegory of the two, right? Israel has what, what, what has happened to Israel. And what's going to happen to Israel again? And when I say Israel, I'm not talking about Yahweh's Israel, the nation of Israel, right? The nation of Israel is made up of the seed of Israel, Jacob, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Anybody, and we're placed there into Israel today by faith. The Messiah seals us, he marks us, and he seals us with the Ruach which is our down payment until he redeems us fully when he comes for us. So that's what we're doing today. And that's the difference. There's a difference between the nation of Israel, which is biblical Zionism, and the state of Israel with its, what are they trying to do, guys? Let's be honest and think about this. What are they trying to do? They are trying to rebuild their temple. They've already done sacrifices. They want to start that again. And the excuse they're saying is so that they can be a blessing to all the earth. What has happened to the nation of Israel in our Bibles every single time they tried to do that and failed? Their temple was destroyed. They were judged. They sent prophets to warn them to return to the book of the law. They would not. So Yahweh judged them by their enemies around them. It is no different to what happened in AD 70. No different. Just like the parables Yeshua says, perhaps if I send my son, he says, they'll listen to my son. So he sends his son. And what did they do to his son? They did the same thing that they've done to the prophets before, and they killed him. But Yahweh rose up from the dead, right? And it made him back alive. So now what are they doing? Then they were destroyed. 2,000 years, there was no Israel. Now all of a sudden, miraculously, we see the state of Israel. It's not the nation of Israel. How do we know that? 
because the nation of Israel is entered into by faith of the son of Yahweh, Yahshua. And he is the only way. He is the doorway. So if you don't enter in that way, then you're the state of Israel. You're not the nation. And 1 John says that you are an antichrist. And the spirit of Yahweh is not in you because it is only gained through his son. That is administration. You see the difference in between and now in the times after Messiah performed his high priestly service and instituted the new covenant under Melchizedek? The time has passed before. Can you see the difference? Rightly divine, brothers and sisters, that's what we're called to do, right? So that's the difference. That's how we walk today. That's how we walk today. Um, by, it's, it, it's by faith. It's by keeping our focus on the same thing they did in Hebrews 11, 12, and 13. We see the Jerusalem above our home. So. I hope that helped anyway. That that's about the, the best I can do as far as clearing up the difference between the two. So thank you. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Uh let me take a look at some scriptures here. Uh this is in uh let's take a look at this right here because this is in reference to the holy city coming down out of heaven. Uh and it says here, uh this is uh John, Revelation of John. Uh, 21, 1 through 7, uh, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Interesting. Uh, notice that this is a reversal of the curse that happened in the days of Peleg, right? Where it says the nations were divided, and what filled the void? What filled the gaps between them? The sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from Yahweh, out of heaven, prepared as a, a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And he himself shall be with them and be their Elohim. With men. Interesting. And Yahweh shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This sounds like a reversal of the curse. Uh, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. Now, uh, if we look in, Ze in uh, Zechariah 14, we see a similar picture here. It says, uh, Behold, the day of Yahweh comes, and they and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. This is talking about the physical city of Jerusalem. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. In other words, it's what's happening to those women right now over there, those, those unfortunates uh, that were taken by Hamas. They're raping them horribly. Uh, but it's going to happen again and when the city is taken over. And half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So it says half the city. So then that presupposes that maybe the other half will be kept unmolested. Now, notice this, then Yahweh goes forth and fights against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great, very great valley, and half of the mountain shall move, remove toward the north and a half of it toward the south, and it says and goes on. It talks about an earthquake. It talks about the the earthly changes that happen. There will be no more day and night. Uh, you know, and it also in Revelation talks about the light of the Lamb shall light the earth. So this is this seems to indicate the the season whereby Yeshua returns. Uh, and then if we look at Second Thessalonians. We have, we see Yeshua coming in the clouds with all the angels and the saints of Elohim. 
And it says, the trump shall sound, and the dead and Messiah will rise first, and then we which remain shall be caught up into the air to be with the master forever. Now, it leaves that picture. But if you put this passage together with Thessalonians, Yeshua clearly comes down to earth, stops the fighting, and be- inaugurates the millennial reign. Okay. Now, the Jews have an idea of Messiah. They call uh, Messiah Ben David. And they think that a man shall arise from within them and lead them to political victory. That's why they're, they're all in a tizzy to put that uh, temple together and so on. They're missing the boat on that. They're missing the boat, clearly. And that I agree with, Brother Sean. Uh, but uh, it does say, even though it will say a new heaven and a new earth, that newness is that it will be restored to its newness. It will be restored. It's like, think of a car. A car that's gone 200, 300,000 miles has gotten all beat up. Uh, do you know that it's possible to take that car and restore it back to looking like new? And it looks like a new car then, okay? Now, let's take a look at Romans chapter 11. This is Paul speaking about the unbelieving Jews. Now, get this, get this in your mind. Speaking about the unbelieving Jews. I say then, hath Yahweh cast away his people? Still calls the Jews his people. By no means, for I am also an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. Yahweh hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Okay, so now the question is, well, who are these fake Jews in Revelation? Uh, you know, that are the seed of the devil. Well, I think I went over this a little bit. Remember that Messiah said of the Pharisees, the leadership, you are of your father, the devil. Did Messiah ever say that about any of the other Jews? Did he say that about Nicodemus? Nicodemus never followed Yeshua. But Yeshua dealt with him very kindly because Nicodemus had the kind of heart that received the knowledge of Elohim. Think about that. Okay, he has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Know ye not that the scripture saith of Eliah, how he maketh intercession to Yahweh against Israel, saying, Yahweh, they kill thy prophets, dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. What's the point of bringing up Eliah? Eliah? Because, because, it's the same situation. Vis-a-vis Christians, believers in Messiah, to the unbelieving Jews, okay? Same situation, okay? But Yahweh did not just smite the nation. At that time, it was the house of Israel that had fallen into idolatry with the golden calves at Dan and Bethel. And that was during the days of Jezebel. She was the one of the worst queens in Israel. But what saith the answer to him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this point's time, also there is a remnant according to the election of favor. Do you know that Yahweh has some unbelieving Jews? That he has considered a remnant because they have a heart like Nicodemus. Okay? And in the very end, they're going to see the truth. The veil is going to be lifted from them, and they will see Messiah Yeshua who, for who he is. Does this in any way denigrate or disenfranchise them from their identity as the house of Judah? Absolutely not. What does the Apostle Paul say? First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. It was a prince of Judah who stepped first down into the Red Sea, according to tradition, and bam, started parting. And it will be the house of Judah who will return first to the land. And then those of us who are of the house of Israel, when the time comes for the second exodus, will return as well. All right, so that's those are some thoughts. Uh, now you may agree with that or not. But uh, that's how I see things. Uh, let's see some comments here. Yeah, the Tabernacle of David rebuilt. All right, any other comments? Uh, I 
Yeah, yeah, brother. I just have a, a couple. Um, so today, so bringing that bringing that thought process forward to today, the people that are in Israel today. Um, so say that they can have their DNA proved to go back to to Judah himself, and 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 they can prove genetically that they are part of the house of Judah, or any other tribe for that matter. Doesn't matter any tribe. What difference does that make? Honestly, it makes no difference today because under our administration, there is no Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. We are all one under Yeshua Messiah. Equal and equal opportunity. It, it is no longer to the Jew first because who are the Jews? And what Do people have to, you know what I mean? I mean, do, do people have to bring in like a DNA test and be a certain percentage, have their blood be Hebrew or Jew to be Jews? No. No, because the message, the target to the gospel message is not to Judah. It is not to the house of Judah. It is in at the sons of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh, according to Torah, and that have been scattered throughout the land. So it doesn't matter whether, whether somebody is a pure 100% person from any house. If they don't have the Messiah, then they are the Antichrist spirit. So that's how you get entered into the Israel of Yahweh is through the Messiah. Genetics have absolutely nothing to do with it. Yeah, that's just my opinion, though, brother. Thank you. Well, I do agree with you on that. Genetics have absolutely nothing to do with it. What it has to do with are the marks of the kingdom of Judah. So how do we know what the marks of the kingdom of Judah is? Well, we go back to the days of King David and his son, Solomon. But remember that uh Solomon had a son by the name of Rehoboam and he was set to take the throne and remember that the elderly advisors who had been with uh his father Solomon advised Rehoboam to be kindly upon the people because whenever a new king would come to power there would be a new arrangement of sorts, you see, a new arrangement. And so uh, the elderly uh, people who were advising Rehoboam's father, Solomon, said, look, you need to, you need to release some of these taxes. You're in a, uh, how shall we say, a position here where you don't have all the foundation or support that your father, Solomon, had, okay? Because there's a lot of discontent out there. That's essentially where they're. But Rehoboam listened to the young whippersnappers, his buddies. They would be like today, you know, you see these young kids are playing games together. Okay. Not the smartest, not the best of the cut. And he listened to them. And instead, what happened is he said, he said to all the house of Israel, the United at time, the whole Commonwealth of Israel, he said to them, if you think, I'm paraphrasing, if you think my father Solomon was hard on you, just wait till you get a load of me. And well, guess what? That caused rebellion. Okay? That caused rebellion. Now, uh, the house of Israel, up from their ranks, came Jeroboam and he took control of 10 tribes and they and he says all Israel to your tents and they all left well uh Jeroboam uh continued to do evil because he noticed that still some people were going to Jerusalem for the feast days and he put his foot down about that and he said in his kingdom in the house of Israel he said uh look I want you guys to go worship these golden calves and he set them up at Dan and Bethel now, if you, if you follow the narrative in the scripture, the Assyrians, literally Yahweh divorced the house of Israel. If you, if you look in the book of Jeremiah, it, it terms these houses as Ahola and Aholibah. Ahola and Ahola. Read that in the book of Jeremiah. Yahweh divorces one of them completely. The, I mean the house, which comprised of 10 tribes, basically. And they were carried away by the Assyrians and they were they were spread out throughout the earth over the centuries. They lost the marks 
of Torah. They lost the marks. But what does the Bible say? Judah yet ruleth with Elohim. This is what it says. But Judah yet ruleth with Elohim. You see? So what are the marks? Okay? Here are the marks. Sabbath. Feast day observance. Clean meat. Okay? Those are all the unique identifiers of the marks. Now I ask you, for those who dispute the people over there in the land, show me, and, and all. And remember, they never lost their identity. They were never divorced or cut off. That's why we just read in Romans chapter 11 that Yahweh did not cut off his people. He still has the nation. They're just in disobedience. They're in disobedience because they rejected the Messiah. And why? Read down through Romans chapter 11. They rejected the Messiah so that you and I, the simple goyim, could come to him and recover our identity as the commonwealth of Israel. We could come into him again and recover our identity under Messiah. But if you show me anywhere else, in the Bible, or, or not in the Bible, but in the world, any other people that are keeping Sabbath? Okay, so they don't believe in the high priest, we do. They don't believe in Yeshua, so, but they're keeping Sabbath. They have all the, the uh, garment accoutrements of what the Torah prescribes. They have the feast days. And I challenge you, you will find no other person. This is why I laugh at the black Hebrew Israelites. Now, I, I don't mean laugh in a way that is disrespectful. I mean that these guys have pants that are drooping down. You know what I'm talking about. And they're wearing Nike shoes, and they're saying, we're of Judah. Really? Really? You don't have any of the marks of Judah. Remember, the house of Judah was never cut off. All right. Uh, I guess we're ready for the rebuttal. <laughs> Go ahead, sister. I got a question for you, Professor. I agree with everything you just said, but my, my question would be, is particularly to your last point. So what about um, if you do not have the son, you do not have the father? Right. That's can right. You relate, can you relate that to your, particularly your last comment? Yeah. Uh, meaning that you don't have access to the heavenlies. You don't have access to favor. You have zero favor. You're still in a state of punishment and denigration and degradation spiritually. You're in a, you're in a place of punishment. You're being punished. You're in the curse. You, you are uh, like, um, you know, the, uh, that's, what, that's the whole point of Paul's talk, uh, that uh, you are now the um, Hagar. You're not a Hagar because you're outside of the will of Elohim. See, you're in punishment because you're outside of the will of Elohim. The will of Elohim is that all men should be saved. The apostle, why was the apostle Paul sent to the Jews first? Because he knew the proper order. To the Jew first and then to the Gentile. To the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Remember that. Uh, yes, they are against Yeshua. But as a nation, Paul clearly says that he himself would wish that he would be killed for the sake of his. Just like, a, just like Moses said, look, slay me. The Apostle Paul understood that the house of Judah, while in punishment, and while they were blinded, and while they were anti-Messiah. You know what anti-Messiah means? It means against Messiah. They're against Yeshua Messiah. Okay? While they are in that punishment condition, the father is not going to allow any word that he has put forth to come back void. And what has he said? He said the house of, Israel, house of Judah would be restored again. And then later, even the whole commonwealth of Israel will be restored. Okay, I can show you many, many prophecies that talk about that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Emerson, the, the beta Israel. Yeah. If they have kept the marks of Judah, the marks of Judah throughout all the centuries and they're not, uh, well, I guess they could be converts, 
I'm not sure I haven't done enough research on that, whether or not they have kept the marks of Judah. Uh, go ahead, Vicki. Or Sean, go ahead. Thanks, brother. I'm looking up something. Where it says in Romans, where Paul is talking about, where you referenced it about how he wishes that he could be cut off for his brother's sake, who was Israel. And then he says that they've been blinded and all that. But then he says, all Israel shall be saved as it is written. Israel, not Judah, not the Jews, all Israel, because he said from his own mouth, I am sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Judah, Judah is not the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were the, they were the, the, the southern tribes. Israel was the north that was scattered. That's who the message goes to. It doesn't, and that's the point is that Judah was saying, we are the, like, like Emerson posted, they were saying, we are the sons of Abraham because we're Jewish, because we have, look at us, we're basically we're the, we're the blood relate, we're the blood generations of Abraham. And Yeshua said, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because Yahweh can make up sons of Abraham from these stones. It's from the heart. It, it is the conversion. So to me, if you have a, a state full of people over there who was like I was saying in the message, their their full goal is not to receive. Actually, they're most of them are violent against Yeshua. If you've ever seen the uh, evangelists, whether they're Christian or Messianic over there trying to share. Uh, as a matter of fact, they wanted to pass a law where it was illegal to evangelize over there. But uh, Netanyahu, realizing that America is their greatest uh, ally, really because of evangelical Christianity, saw the foolishness in that and said, no, we're not passing that. But that shows you the heart over there. And they reject the Messiah. So, yeah, anti-Messiah Messiah means against. So we can all say, well, they're just against him. No. And is the anti-Messiah, that same spirit is what they're under because the spirit of the enemy drives the purpose of the spirit of the enemy is to push you away from the Messiah. So you don't know the truth, which is the Messiah. So by them promoting that and by us saying it's okay that they're, they're, they're just blinded, that's okay. They're still Yahweh's people. They're just blinded. No, they're not. They are the anti-Messiah. They are the enemies of the cross because that's what they're doing. And it's the same thing they were doing then, right? The book of Acts tells you what, who were the enemy. It's the same enemy that has always been and the same enemy today. Those that are violent against the Messiah. Now, we have those, the remnant that has been pulled out of there, right? But there's a far more people becoming the faith in Yeshua out of Islam by far than there is out of pharisaical type Judaism that's over there, by far. There's some being saved, praise Yahweh for that. But that's just how it is because they are rebellious against Yahweh and they are violent against his son, who is the only way to enter into covenant with them is through his son. So by saying anti messiah they're just against him, that is a huge statement because they're basically against the son of, of Yahweh, who we preach who were commissioned to bring forth to people in, in truth. So if somebody is an enemy against that, then, it, then their intentions and whether they have Torah and keep Shabbat is irrelevant. They can keep Shabbat till the cows come home and be perfectly walking in, 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 book, in the book of the law of Torah. But if they don't have a relationship with the son, then it's all just dead works, right? We know that. That's, that's We all know that. So, you know, yes, we should be praying for them for sure. We pr I pray for Israel every single day, the state of Israel. I pray that those people, not that they're kept safe, that they open their eyes to their Messiah who they keep rejecting and killing and their prophets that are they're having prophets today sent to them, right? People like you and I, us who share with our loved ones and people that we know, we put forth this truth of the Messiah. Right, not as the Christians do, and not as as some of the messianics that are that just want to be Jewish. They just want to drag the Messiah along, but they want to stay under the book of the law. And and if if they ever start the temple over there and start the offerings, you don't think they'll be there? How many of our Hebrew roots people that you've met over your lifetime you think would actually be there? Thinking that because these are Yahweh's chosen people, and absolutely not. That time is done. 
that as that to do that now it says that we stomp on the blood of the messiah we 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 make that small so we need to be very careful brothers and sisters this is not the time to compromise and we need to stand for truth i i am on fire for this for this truth because we need to be very very wise because that because our enemy is subtle the entire world this is for whoever can take it the entire world believes that the state of Israel was founded by Yahweh. That's what they believe. And there has been world wars due to that. Both of them were due to that fact. And that is a historical fact that I am about. I'm working on a presentation. And, and I won't present it during Shabbat because of the nature of the message. But I am going to do it in my room. And it is going to prove with documented historical fact what I'm saying is true. And at that point, then we have to decide, what are we going to do? Do we stand for truth, no matter how unpopular it is? Because you know what, brothers and sisters? It is a small remnant. The road to life is a narrow path. It is not a broad road. And, what, and while the rest of the world goes after that and chases after the state of Israel and, 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 and the world we're about to go into, into World War III, Again, what is the trigger in event? Why? Because of the state of Israel. We are over there about to go to war with the entire Middle East, which will draw Russia and China into it. Why? For the same reason World War I and World War II was founded. And now World War III, because it is those that are say they are Jews and are not. That's facts. That is facts. Hard to hear or not, that's facts. We are the we are the messiahs. We belong to the Messiah, guys. So let's walk as a royal priesthood and leave the things behind that need to be left. So thank you, brother. Okay, uh, thanks for those comments. Uh, we get some lively uh, debate going, don't we? Sometimes uh, here in this Yahad room, uh, we got some comments here. We should be discerning as to what part of Zionism would be considered biblical. Talmudic Zionism or maybe Satanic Zionism is possibly a better description of what is being practiced by those who say they are Jews but are not. Or are they? Notice how they say they're Jews. Notice that. The world doesn't recognize them as Jews. They say they're Jews. That's why I think they're the black Hebrew Israelites. And I think they're going to be an incredible persecuting power. Now, you study those black Hebrew Israelites. They are racist. So all get out. Uh, okay, uh, anyway, the Zionist in charge of the country of Israel, now doing the deeds of Abraham and their Zionism, just a thought. Thank you for that comment, brother. Uh, Albert Pike, yeah, I'm familiar with his uh, thing there. Uh, numbers, 1131. And a wind went forth from Yahweh. Yeah, that's the quail one. Yep, yep. That's the quail one. That's that's what Yahweh is doing to the house of Judah right now. That's what Yahweh is doing to the house of Judah. You want to you want an analogy? There it is. Numbers eleven thirty one. Okay, they they wanted to reject their Messiah, but now it's like that quail just rotting in their mouths, and they have they have had that rotting quail for two thousand years, and it's still going to be there until they say what? What must they say? Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. And at that point, they're going to recognize Yeshua Messiah. And a remnant of them will be saved. Just like those 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal or to Talmudic poppycock uh, stuff that goes against Yah's law. Okay. All right. All right, guys. Wow. What a, uh, what a discussion. All right, uh, so uh, we are going to close now, and I thank you all for taking part. Uh, I suspect this video is going to get a lot of a lot of views, uh, Jackson. <laughs> and this, uh, uh, some know. of these opinions are appalling to me. Yeah. Uh, taking the scripture so far out of context, especially the context of time. Uh, appalling better rethink some things thank you brother thank you you're welcome
All right. Uh, so let's do the final blessing. Uh, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you. Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and give you shalom in Yeshua's name. See you next time.